We at the Other Side of Hell podcast are not therapists, doctors, or counselors. We're just two guys who have been through hell and come out the other side. Please be aware, we may talk about drinking and drugging in detail. Anyone struggling with addiction may find this triggering. Our goal is to share our stories, explore our struggles, and connect with others through our experience. Remember, we are not alone. There is hope, and together we can get better. Hey everybody, what's up? I am Cameron. And I'm Willie. And today we are joined by not one, but two amazing special guests. We have here Marty and Jackson. Hey, what's up, everybody? How's it going, man? I'm Jackson. How's everybody today? Great, great. They can't, they can't answer you that, but it's oh. nice of you to ask. Right. I mean, exactly. they're probably in their car saying, good. <laughs> yeah. I'm actually good right now. <laughs> Thank you for asking. <laughs> I'm feeling fine. <laughs> <laughs> or fucked up. I mean, we get some people on here that are struggling, too, yeah. you know? So. Yeah. Hey man, it is so good to have you guys here. We uh, so so we just uh, we filmed an episode with Jackson, and uh, we had a surprise visit from Marty who happened yeah. to drop into the studio. Yeah, and so we thought, let's get him on the damn show. It's about yeah. time, Marty, yeah. and he's going to be a great great uh, guest for our topic. Yeah, it's totally perfect because we were actually talking before the show as we do. Um, you know, before any show. And naturally, we just sort of started talking about the topic, which is recovery maintenance. Yeah. So I couldn't think of, uh, of any two better guests to have on for this show and uh, or for this topic. And this topic today was inspired by this week's war story that we got from Adam. Yeah. And Adam had an amazing story. And he is somebody who lives in the middle of this program. And as he talks about in his story, that is so crucial yeah. so marty let me ask you dude first of all it is so good to see you in person and to yeah. meet you and to have you here and and to finally have you on the show and I'm, I'm just so super blessed and grateful to call you a friend and and uh and i just want to ask you like what when we talk about like recovery maintenance what's the first thing that comes to mind for you uh, thank you guys for having me down here man this is really cool uh recovery maintenance uh you know, to me is step work is recovery maintenance to me. I, I, I know that without step work, I am not maintaining. I am absolutely insane Mm -hmm. without it. And so when you say maintenance, that's what I think. You think immediately you go into the steps. Absolutely. Sure. And that's like 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Right. And we talk about, uh, you know, they say that 10, 11, and 12 are, are the maintenance steps. Um, and, uh, you know, I've, I've found that to be true. But what, I mean, what, uh, what is so important about maintaining that recovery? Is it something that we have to do on a daily, on a daily um, occurrence? Jackson, have you, have you found that to be the case? Yeah, you know, I think um, about this whole recovery maintenance thing and you know, actually the application of you know, a 12 step program. It's like, I got to be constantly aware of myself, you know, that awareness of myself allows me to see, you know, it wasn't just the drugs and the alcohol. It was that pre-existing condition in my mindset, my ideas, my emotions and my attitudes. I got to be able to constantly be on the lookout for those things right there. And that's what the 12 steps um, allows me to see just like you, you know, you know how to drive a stick shift just because you know how to drive the stick shift. You know, you got to know where to apply those proper steps to each one of these human conditions. They call them human conditions. And, you know, everyone deals with things, uh, depression and anger and uh, rage and dis- depression, uh, 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 discouragement. All these things are regular human conditions. And I got to have some sort of a maintenance coping mechanism to allow me to see it when it shows up and how to actually process it out. And that's what the 12 steps, it's a processing uh, tool that we can use to dial in so that I can continue. Because again, you know, I get loaded coming out of a sober state. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm I'm cool with the fact that, you know, the, the sober state of mind is what requires this daily maintenance. And that requires, you know, some, some work in me being aware of me, mm-hmm. me being aware of my condition, that selfish, self-centered condition. So, again, that, that daily maintenance, again, puts <clears throat> me in direct connection with the fact that, A, you know, 
my thinking. B, I'm going to need something to help me with that thinking. And, and C, you know, I got a fellowship of people that I can really stay connected to, stay in the middle with. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and I really appreciate you saying that because I think that we're, we're not just talking about staying sober, right? Like, these these are things I need to do, and there are things I need to do definitely every day to stay sober, but it's more than that, Yeah. Right? Like, I've got to connect spiritually in order to have that emotional sobriety, which Absolutely. for me is, like, super, super obvious when I don't when I'm not maintaining, like I start going crazy Mm -hmm. and I, and I understand and I recognize and I can see very clearly that if I stay in that state too long, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I will indeed turn to what I have turned to so many times before. Mm -hmm. And so that's my experience. Yeah. I don't like, like while you guys are talking, I'm, I'm like visualizing this thing in my head, but like, for one, in, in order for me to have anything that I need to maintain, I need to have something, mm-hmm. right? What is it that I'm maintaining, right? And so if, if I think about it like before sobriety, before I came into recovery this last time, I was like roaming by foot aimlessly throughout life. And Alcoholics Anonymous and the, and the program of AA gave me a vehicle mm-hmm. to a spiritual destination, if you will, right? And now I have all these moving parts of this spiritual vehicle that's going to take me where I need to go. And so I need to be checking the parts of this motherfucker. Like, like Marty knows, like maintaining one of them rigs, you know, you you, you have all these, you have all these moving parts, you know, you have the, 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 the the sobriety part of it, not using and drinking like, like if you want to be sober, just don't fucking drink. Right. That doesn't work for alcoholics. But, but when you break it down to what is being sober, it's not drinking alcohol. It's not taking drugs. But, you know, I have all these parts. Sobriety is part of that. That's that's one part. I have to maintain that sobriety. How mm-hmm. do I do that? Through continually looking at the powerlessness and unmanageability, admitting my powerlessness and unmanageability, you know, and being able to do that on a daily basis, going through and, and checking my spirituality, you know, like like Cameron likes to say, bring it in for a landing mm-hmm. and, and check the gear out, you know, going to meetings. That's another moving part of this whole thing that I have to maintain, you know, what, what are my motives in going to these meetings? Sometimes, you know, they're selfish and I'll, I'll lose myself in a meeting through selfish ego, fucking showing everybody how recovered I am and trying to say the cool shit and, 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 and being the showpiece of the meeting, you know, but other times I'm really there doing the spiritual work that's needed Mm -hmm. to be the, the, the vessel for the message that needs to be shared, you know? So what is it I'm trying to maintain? What what was I given that that I'm maintaining my sanity, huh? Oh, Ooh. Amen. <laughs> that's what Ooh. I, I mean. Amen. I just I just felt like that. That's what it was again. Because again, I will return to that insanity. I will return to that to that sanity, to that insanity. If I don't continue the maintenance mm-hmm. again, what am I trying to maintain? I'm trying to maintain my sanity, that serenity. Because again, that was a place I became real familiar with. The insanity, and I prided myself in being insane. You know what I mean? That was like a, <laughs> right, <laughs> right. And, and and again, and it's just it's like right. really, it just it got away from me though. It like it really got away from me. I thought it was you know really something to you know, ins- yeah. But, but again, it it really took a hold of me and took me to places where whoa, it wasn't yeah. supposed to go Trying that to way. Maintain your buzz. Yeah. <laughs> Remember that statement? <laughs> got to maintain my buzz. Yeah. Just yeah. got to maintain. Yeah, and again, that's that's a that's a I space like where, that, man. Yeah, maintain that gift of sanity that we were given. That's what I feel like for me, anyway. Like I said, that's 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 a space that I know. Like I said, but if I don't, I wake up the moment I open my eyes. You know, those insane thoughts will come. The the crazy, the the weird stuff comes instantly. So I need I need I need to get out in front of this. You know, on awakening. You mm-hmm. know, and that's mm-hmm. that's part of my maintenance is on awakening. You know. I immediately, you know, think, okay, well, I got some stuff to do, but hey, God, can you direct my thinking here? And like I said, it sounds like, but it's something. I actually do that and ask for that. Yeah, it shows. Yeah. You know, it shows that you that you perform maintenance. You clean your vehicle. Totally. That kind of shit. Yeah. yeah. Maintenance. One of the best things I ever heard about that, about, you know, sort of daily maintenance, is I can't stay sober today on yesterday's sobriety. So it's like I've got to do something mm-hmm. each day and... and um for me, it, it, it's it got to be a morning thing. I got to do it first thing Absolutely. because 
if I don't get up and, and do that immediately, then mm. I start getting in my own way. Full, full on, bro. Yeah. Full and, on. And, and I start believing the things that I, that I am thinking. Fucking put the clown shoes on right off the rib. Yeah. Right? <laughs> start tripping over shit. Exactly. And, and it's true. I mean, and that, you know, I've proven to myself each time, like without it, without that routine in the morning, like I am wandering, I'm a blubbering idiot. Yeah. Like I just, just try not to do that routine. And I just wander around. Like I have no idea what to do. Like I need that to start my day, to get directed, to, to figure out, you know, like how, how the rest of my day is going to go. Yeah. And not that it's going to go perfect, but hopefully I'll be able to handle each thing as it comes you know, with that sort of start to my day. Yeah. You ever tried to, you ever tried start and sharing at a meeting without identifying yourself as an alcoholic? Like (laughs) that's kind of how, what you're talking about. That's what it reminds me of. I I cannot share like starting the podcast. I cannot start this show without saying what's up world. Willie can't actually say anything on camera without saying (laughs) what's up world. Like like you're saying, but like what he was saying, like it has to start the moment that I open my eyes, right? That we have to start into that, that maintaining the sanity. Well, absolutely. You've got to have for, I have to have Mm -hmm. that guidance first thing in the morning. First thing, you know, um, you know, we're pretty good about, tagging each other on Instagram mm-hmm. first thing in the morning. You know, yeah. that's what we do. And that's the kickstart to the guidance so that I don't get off track during the day. Because no matter what mm-hmm. goes wrong, if I'm staying in my program, I can get through that. Mm-hmm. But if I wake up in the morning and I forget that I need to do my meditation, my prayer, everything like that, then something is missing, right? Mm-hmm. And I start to be pissed off at everybody all day, you know, uh, me and Willie have had a couple of conversations about this. Like I get up and I don't do my maintenance in the morning. I'm like, I'm going to quit my job, (laughs) divorce my wife. (laughs) Yeah. You know, it's going south. Right. Fast. That, that, that untreated alcoholism comes back. Mm -hmm. And if you do that long enough, then we're going to treat it the way that we know how to treat it. Right. Like we've seen it so many times in the, in the rooms with the newcomer and the old timer alike that make the decision, you know, either consciously or subconsciously, I don't need to pray today. I don't need to write Mm -hmm. today. I don't need to connect today. And for whatever reason, I I, I keep bringing it back to, because I guess the only thing I know how to maintain other than this recovery stuff or, pieces of equipment you know and if i don't if i don't charge my batteries on my on my cordless shit then when i go to use them then they don't fucking work you know mm-hmm. and if, if i don't keep air in my tires and i don't keep grease in the in the cogs then the shit seizes up and it's and it's useless it's a useless piece of equipment you know and i have to throw it away and start over mm-hmm. i think that analogies that you use you know you know a machine a car <clears throat> our daily maintenance is is just like that in re- in recovery. I mean, I, we have to have this these analogies put into place, and we want to communicate these analogies to really explain and really to see the depth of you know what am I doing here in sobriety? What am I doing here in recovery? Are there things that I really do need to employ on a daily <clears throat> basis? My cell phone, you know, that's a perfect example. You know, cell phone works per- perfectly fine until that red f- battery starts flashing. <laughs> and I know at that moment in time, I need to get it to a charger. Mm-hmm. Same thing with me. When I when my red battery light starts flashing, I can feel it and I can uh-huh. see it internally. I know at this point I need to either check a prayer, call another dude, uh, to do something outside of myself because my red battery is flashing. Yeah. And that's the analogy that I was able to attach to to understand what is this recovery sustaining all about what's Mm -hmm. what what's what what do i have to do well like i said that battery or that cell phone works perfectly fine until that juice is out and as a as a human my juice runs out yeah my 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 patience my tolerance my, my my ability to interact with others sometimes that actually runs thin so again, when that happens, I know when, how to recognize it as, hey, there's a red light right there. I can see red lights and I know, hey, I need to you know, maybe a third step real quick or maybe call one of my sponsees. And again, that allows me to recharge, reset. Mm-hmm. And, and again, that's just yeah. what's, how I work it. That's, that's yeah. the analogy I needed. 
for sure. It's a, it's a great point to talk about the warning signs because there are warning signs that maybe we're not doing enough, right? Like there's not, like maybe, maybe like we, we get thrown these signs throughout each day or maybe mm-hmm. you know, on a weekly basis or whenever we can see very clearly it's okay. I'm, I'm not doing something. Like mm-hmm. if yeah. I, like I know that if I'm interacting with somebody and I don't react the way that I generally know that I have the skills and ability to act, like I'm short, like I'm snarky. Totally. I I say some sarcastic ass comment because that's just who I am. Like I know that I'm missing something. Mm. I know that I'm not doing something. Like I know that I need to like uh, analyze that situation again and say, okay, like, do I owe that person an amend? Like, and sometimes I do, you know. <laughs> and that's a ten step. What you right. that that's yeah. that spot check. And yep. again, again, that's the application. Like Marty was saying, with the steps, and that's how we're living. Ten, eleven, and twelve. Mm-hmm. That spot check throughout the day, not just at the night. You know, my spot check when I'm wrong, not if I'm wrong, right? <laughs> right. I'm, I'm, I'm probably right. going. And when I'm wrong, doesn't necessarily mean to you. I could be wrong towards myself. Yeah. That self pity or dishonesty. That stuff kicks in, and I got to be able to see it. And call it. That's a step 10 right there. Step 11 says, hey, God, can you help me out over here? Redirect me, re-guide me. And that's a step 11. And then 12 kicks in. I could turn my attention to help someone else. And that's mm-hmm. textbook, just like that. And I'm wrong. God, can you help me? Find somebody else to help. That's the textbook right there. Boom. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, you guys are talking about the sanity part of it. And for me personally, you know, I, I, I don't necessarily have a fear of using but i do have a fear of losing my sanity Mm -hmm. i was at about 10 years sober and thought i had it figured out Mm -hmm. didn't need meetings no more Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um tired of it and my sanity left and i became homicidal Mm -hmm. you know and a couple of my family members were the ones that were going to be on that receiving end Mm -hmm. and thank god somebody from the program come walking up and pointed his finger in my face and told me to shut my mouth and get in the car. Nice. And I told him, I don't know what's wrong. Mm -hmm. I don't understand what's wrong with me. And he said, what do you mean you don't know what's wrong? You don't go to meetings. Mm -hmm. You don't work steps. You don't have a sponsor. What do you mean you don't know what's wrong? Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, that hit me pretty hard. And so that maintenance to me, you know, you, you hit it right on the head is is the sanity part of it you know i don't want to be insane mm-hmm. right i we'll live there. there yeah we'll it's go painful. right back there that's it's like painful. our default our default mm-hmm. is insanity and we got years and careers of experience to show that's how i live on my own self-will unaided unaided self-will is insane Mm-hmm. And, and and it, it, it just there's no there's no <laughs> as, as, as hard it is as it is to admit <laughs> yeah. right yeah I mean, like, yeah I, and again and I'll tell myself everything is cool undercover or it's them it's they they made right. me this way yeah so like I said it's it's a, it's a cool thing yeah it's a great point it can be a tough pill to swallow but I mean do you remember let, let's just go back to like those early early days in recovery right and yeah. we would we would see these people like I remember for example um, in a treatment center the the counselor that I had was somebody that was in a 12 step program and he would talk about how he would wake up at I don't know 4:30 or 5 o'clock and mm-hmm. do like yeah, gross. A, a half an hour or 45 minutes of meditation. And gross. I was like, you fucking have to do that every day. Yeah, yeah. Like it was just, it was so weird and foreign to hear that that's, that's how somebody that's would a, start their day. That's the solution. No, yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> Did you hear the problems right. that I have? Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, I mean, think about that. Like when we were that early in recovery and we talked about it, you know, before, like we would go into meetings and we would see people with 20 years and be like, you don't have it figured out yet. Like, (laughs) you know what I mean? Like, and, and, and sort of how we come around to this idea of, okay, that is what's necessary. And like, not only do we surrender to the solution, which is a power greater than ourselves in a 12 step program, but we also surrender to the maintenance that it takes. Right. right? And understand that that's all a part of the process. So what at what point do you feel like you you realized that that was going to be something that you had to do every day? Was that early in your recovery, Marty? You know, I I was sharing with you guys earlier. You know that uh, when I got here, I thought that 
I already had all the answers. You know, I'd been in and out of out of AA and NA meetings since I was very young. You know, the judge would make me go, and I can remember looking around, being like, you know, I don't like these people. Um, I don't want to be like these people. So when I got here, I thought, well, I know that these people have found some sobriety. So I'm just going to go in and I'm going to learn in a couple of weeks exactly what they've done for all of these years because they're dumbasses, right? <laughs> I'm pretty smart. So I'm going to learn what they've done and then I'll take it out there on the street and I'll apply it and I won't have to worry no more. Mm-hmm. Now I have to come for 20 years. Right, yeah. exactly. I don't have to sit in here like that old bastard across the table from me, you know? And as I started getting into it, I started learning that it is a daily Mm -hmm. daily Mm -hmm. thing that I have to do in order to maintain my sobriety. Yeah. Well, hopefully we see some results that can give us the inspiration. You know, like we start seeing like some of that sanity return. Like we start doing it one day at a time and we start, you know, recognizing just how insane we had been and how we're getting some relief by doing this on a daily basis. And so, you know, even though it's a hard pill to swallow at first, the results, you know, prove themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, I can see that this is necessary. If I want B, I have to have A. Yeah. It's so, it's so weird too, like the way that we do this stuff, because like, it seems like uh, that question that you ask Marty, like, when do we realize that it has to be a daily thing, Mm -hmm. right? Like at what point in our sobriety it, it, and for me, it's always at some point of pain, right? Like, sure. Like there's always some something involved where, you know, I'll, I'll be paying really close attention to one area of my life and these other areas will slack and then I'll lose complete sight of everything altogether. And then I'll feel like the job of cleaning house becomes so overwhelming that I don't do anything. And I'm like, well, I'll just do it all tomorrow. Like tomorrow I'll just, I'll just get it all back in, in place. And then I do that for a couple weeks or a couple months. And then I'm in that insanity. Mm-hmm. And that's what brings me back to understanding that it's going to be a daily thing. But the weird thing about that is the weird thing about that is, is that when I go back and I, redo the maintenance on my program i feel amazing yeah like i feel like i've just conquered the world all over again you know the air in the tires are good the grease in the bearings are good the oil's all good and i feel like a good responsible person again Mm -hmm. you know and i want to share it with the world you know it becomes this part of like this, this part of my self esteem, but I, I don't know. I wish it didn't come with so much pain, because <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm so fucking smart, right? My thing, it was kind of weird because when you were saying that, I'm thinking to myself, okay, so I was in a rehab, you know, and that rehab I was in, <clears throat> we had to learn the third step prayer and seven step prayer in order to, you know, advance to the next, you know, phase of rehab. And I was having such a hard time memorizing the third step prayer. And one of the counselors said to me, you'll never, you'll never get it until you actually understand what that prayer. She said, she goes, you're not just talking to the air. Right. And she said, when you can attach, when you can attach yourself to what those, to what that third step prayer is saying, then you'll be able to get it. Mm. So I came into it more from a, you know, experimental slash uh, uh, psychological slash logics position, if you will. Mm-hmm. And then this is like my first, probably like my first six months in, in recovery. So super early recovery. And I realized, okay, that third step prayer, God, I'll offer myself to thee. And I was like, you know, for what? And then I was like, to build with me and to do with me as I will relieve me of the bondage of self. And when I hit that part, mm-hmm. I remember thinking to myself, I thought I was the bondage of drugs and alcohol. So when when I caught that, and I went and I told my my cat my counselor. I said I said bondage of self. What is that supposed to mean? Because I didn't know bondage of self. And I realized that you know stone cold sober. Remember, I get loaded again. So I'm going to have to do this on a daily basis. But it went from I'm going to have to do this to you know it's it makes more sense to do this on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. And ever mm-hmm. since that time, again, third step prayer, seven step prayer, just became a routine part of when I wake up and say, God, direct me. You know, direct my thoughts. And again, early recovery, it was total 
logical breakdown as to, hey, this this prayer makes sense. I want to continue to do this. I need to continue to do this because there's there was some power in there. I thought I was yeah. totally, you know, subjected to the powers of, of drugs and alcohol, and it was the bondage, you know, of my own self. So selfishness yeah. and self centeredness that we think. Yeah, man, that was the, that's what it was. And again, that was a cool place where I could say, hey, look, every day I'm going to be susceptible to me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How am I going to check myself? How am I going to, you know, keep myself, you know, in check every day? So I employed that one. You know, third step prayer was pretty huge for me. Yeah. Well, I appreciate the fact that you talked about the psychological aspect of it and and just the logical aspect yeah. of it, because it does it. It makes sense to me to start the day with intention. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like <laughs> if if I get yeah. up and I'm just aimless i have no direction like who the fuck knows what kind of day i'm gonna have but if i get up and i connect immediately and i set the intention for the day and then like psychologically physiologically i am more apt to go out and kind of have the day that i'd like to have otherwise i'm just to the wolves or to myself (laughs) which is just as bad yeah exactly (laughs) yeah um, and so, yeah, I really appreciate the fact that you brought that up, Jackson. It's a good point to remember is that it's a good idea from a psychological or physiological standpoint, no matter what, to just set that intention, you know, mm-hmm. in motion each day. And for me, it's crucial for my mm-hmm. recovery. Straight up. So, yeah, I, I appreciate this topic. I think it's important to talk about because it is something that, uh, that we, we have to do, like, and another thing I think that's important is that we have, you know, we have some fun in recovery. Like that's a part of our maintenance, right? Is is to remind ourselves that we can still have fun even though hmm. we're sober. Yeah. How fun, how fun is it to be able to sit back and meet a couple of guys, right? And then decide, hey, you know what? I'm gonna hop on a plane. <laughs> yeah. And I'm gonna fly I'm gonna take a flight out to Utah. <clears throat> This is fun to me it's today. It's way fun. Right? And I get to I get to come in this cool studio, see some people that, that are doing the deal, and I get to participate. I mean, like, I would have never been able to do this. I never would have did this, you know, chasing that. Fuck. I, know, I couldn't it, even go to my favorite concert it, out you know? there. <laughs> so, so you can talk about fun. I mean, look at, look at what it is. It's a challenge for me today to, to have fun. And again, there's so many different opportunities. I just had to be open to it and be willing to go and do it. You know, this is fun. Like, I just love going through the airport. Yeah. <laughs> I could I could get on a plane and I got every all my ID and everything is in place and I'm gonna get through the TSA and yeah, it was, it's just how'd you get a picture thing. with the pilots? How'd you do that? Yeah, that was cool. Yeah, that looked fun. How fun was that, right? Yeah, again, I would have <laughs> never, ever did that, man. So I just got on the plane and I was like, man, you know what? I had to. I, I, I got a front seat because again, I just I paid the extra thirty seven bucks to get in a front seat, you know. And I leaned over and I looked into the cockpit thing and I'm like, they're just sitting there chilling. They look pretty chill. I said, I, I said, hey, can I get a picture? Hey, can I get a picture? They're like, yeah, come on. And they're like, you know, mask on or mask off, whatever. And they totally welcomed me into yeah. the, again, That's that that was fun. That was yeah. cool to yeah. be able to get up there with the pilots, and they took a picture with me. I'm like, yeah, that, that, like I said, I thought it was pretty stoked. Yeah, I was yeah. Pretty stoked with yeah it was way cool. You know? hey, well, when we maintain a clean house, right, like like we, we're approachable. Yeah, like, that like energy, there's, yeah. Because yeah. a... she kind of looked at me, too, I, I remember, because they kind of like, before they were like, like, trying to look at me, see, is this a crazy dude who wants to come in the cockpit to take a picture? Yeah. And she kind of looked at it. It was a female pilot. And then the co pilot got, he leaned over and they both kind of gave me like a, a once over. Yeah. And again, like you said, the, the energy that, that I, you know, hope that I'm projecting is, is that yeah. of a positive, you know, solid, you know, good energy. And they looked over and they're like, oh, yeah, come on. And I was like, and I, I actually did think about that. I'm like, whoa, they looked at me. Yeah. I could tell that they were like, they got a check this out man any old body coming up in here yeah so that was kind of cool yeah because i think i think it's important like you know we've talked about you know what the maintenance is kind of you know and and we've all sort of agreed on you know you know maintaining that connection with our fellowship whatever that is you know you can find that in a church you can find it in the meetings like we have you know in self-help groups or Mm -hmm. or a specific therapy group Mm -hmm. uh online stuff you know maintain 
you know, with, with your fellowship, with your step work, whatever that program is, you know, for us, it's the 12 steps, Mm -hmm. uh, maintain that connection with the people individually. You know, for us, it's one alcoholic helping another, you know, maintain that, that, uh, belief or, or attempt to connect with a power greater than ourselves so that, uh, we can recognize that we're not in charge and we're not alone. And, you know, we kind of agree with all those things and, and why they're important. What, what's the payoff for that, right? Like, mm-hmm. because for, for us, you know, there's moments where we can step out of self and we can do this stuff selflessly, but there's a payoff mm-hmm. for us doing this maintenance, you know? For me, it makes my life a lot more manageable and a lot less painful mm-hmm. uh, yeah. uh, doing this stuff intentionally. And, and the cool thing about it is, I don't notice it, but I continue to grow. Mm -hmm. I continue to grow in this stuff. Absolutely. You know, when I do these maintenance things, you know, what do you think? What do you think, Marty? You know, having fun, I was sitting here thinking while you guys were talking about when I got here, there was no fun, (laughs) you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It wasn't fun for me. Um, It wasn't fun for me. (laughs) You know, I mean, I, I had... I, I laughed. Seriously, I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had seriously mm-hmm. like, I was at the end of my road, you know, and and I can remember early in meetings where these people would be laughing, and they'd be planning these barbecues <laughs> and and stuff like that, and I'm like, man, that is cool, you know, because number one, nobody invited me to go nowhere, yeah, you know, and and so I would go to these events or whatever and everybody be laughing and playing horseshoes and doing all this stuff and i'm like man recovery is probably not going to be too bad you know if it's like this yeah you know and so you know i i think that having fun sitting around chopping it up with all you guys we Mm -hmm. have shared a lot of laughs in this room tonight Mm -hmm. and that's what it's about for me yeah you know because like i said when i got here man it was no fun Mm-hmm. You know, I got here with a needle hanging out of my neck, yeah. and uh, I was at the end of my rope. You put it there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or I had you do it. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? It's like... Or you paid me to do it. Right, <laughs> right, man. And and well, who I don't do that no more, man. Yeah. I, la- I laugh more than I cry, well, and that, for me, is huge. I mean, who would have thought that that would be our definition of fun? Like, to be to be in a room full of... like I. Yesterday I went to a meeting. It was uh, pretty powerful. Like, and we we were we were talking about sex, right? Which was weird because you don't talk about that generally in a in a meeting. Uh, but it was a men's meeting, and you know, like we have sex problems, right? Sex relations, um, and and it occurred to me at some point, like forty five minutes into the meeting, I'm like, this is fun mm-hmm. <laughs> to be sitting here in a room with like twenty other dudes talking about sex openly and honestly, you know, some dudes are over there crying like as they share and, 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 and who would have thought that that would be my definition of fun today? You know, like looking at this hard shit, talking about this uncomfortable stuff to think that that's what fun is for me today is kind of, kind of crazy. But we like even this morning, like in between, you know, uh, shows we're talking about, um, recovery and we're laughing our asses off, yeah. sharing war stories and, and not, and, and, you know, we make it a point, Jackson, I think he made it a point to say, I'm not romanticizing it. We laugh because we know we have this in common and we can laugh about it now. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, because we know where each other has been and like, that's our way of connecting and, and, and that's what we get now instead of, you know, the, the loneliness, the emptiness that we had, the no fun that the we no had fun. when and, we came in the room. And and to that point, Cam, um, part of the fun of it is, you know, if there are you know, people listening to this right now, you know, to be able to share those stories like this, to be able to provide this platform once again, again, <sighs> It's, it's, it's some fear that, that does surface in doing this kind of stuff, but it's so important to be able to tell your story. It literally does become a sense of fun. It becomes mm-hmm. a sense of fun because that's our real life experience that we actually now get to talk about. We actually get to see and understand and connect the dots as to all of that hell that we went through. You know, it is fun to be able to reflect 
mm-hmm. and see, hey, that's what I was doing, bro, and that's what I'll do again. And this platform yeah. to do a podcast, you know, I encourage people, if you're listening, if you've never done podcasts, if you've never, you know, told your story or talked about it, you had a little bit of fear, but it will subside once you start talking about it because you're telling your truth. Mm-hmm. You're sharing your truth with someone else. And it's really fun and relieving to see that, you know, maybe just somebody else, you know, shared that same experience and we can laugh about it. Yeah. The laughter's coming no matter what. Yeah, it, it's right. definitely coming out. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you saying that. And I think that that's actually a great, a great segue and opportunity for to get, for us to get into uh, to Adam's story. Adam! And remember now, <laughs> this topic was inspired by Adam's story. Yeah. 12 um, years. Yeah. You guys will... No, almost 15 years he's got. Nice. Yeah. You And you guys will hear how it is we came to this conclusion to talk about this topic once you hear his story. But... We're excited to share it with everybody, and uh, and I couldn't think of anybody else I'd rather have sitting next to me as we do. So with that, let's let everybody have a listen. So let's do it. Let's do it. This week's War Story is brought to you by Brainwash Coffee. Brainwash Coffee is damn good coffee with a damn good cause. 50% of all proceeds go back into the recovery community, which is why Brainwash Coffee is the perfect partner for us here at the other side of hell. With blends like Higher Powder and Ego Ain't Your Amigo, Brainwash Coffee has your back no matter what your poison. Right now, you can get $5 off your coffee order when you use promo code OTHERSIDE at brainwashcoffeeco.com. Clean your bean with Brainwashed. And without further ado, here is this week's War Story. Um, hey guys, my name is Adam. I'm an addict and alcoholic. Um, again, greatly appreciate this opportunity to be on the podcast uh, today. So this is a, a really great opportunity. Um, so I'm just going to share with you guys again what it was like, what happened, what it's like today, um, and, and just kind of share with you kind of the journey of recovery. So um, my sobriety date is December 22nd, 2006. So I got sober at 23 years old. And, um, and I, in the beginning, I wasn't very grateful for that because I thought I still had a lot of life and party to live. But, um, you know, today I'm really grateful that I did get sober at 23. Um, and that, you know, be next birthday, I'll be 39 years old and, and still clean and sober to this day. So, uh, relapse is not a part of my story. Uh, not yet, at least, um, I always like to say yet because it always can be if I don't continue to take care of myself and, and work my program. So, um, I attend, attend meetings uh, still probably twice a week. I talk to my sponsor at least twice a week on the phone um, on the way to work. Um, I still pray and meditate every morning, even if it's just as simple as the serenity prayer or, um, you know, just, hey, help me today, you know, help me not to be, you know, like a horrible human being and, and help me try to be helpful to other people. Um, and then I still meet with sponsees and, you know, get to do step work with them. And I'm really grateful for that because that is a huge part of my program. But um, Again, I'm 30, 38 years old. Um, I lived all over the country. I, uh, I moved from uh, Montgomery, Alabama when I was four, and then to Atlanta for a couple of years, and then to Arkansas for a year, Washington State and Oregon, and then back to Arkansas for a couple of years, back to Florida, uh, or not back to Florida, to Florida. Um, and then I moved to Birmingham for one year, went to high school here for my senior year, went to college off at Auburn. And then, uh, and that's kind of like, so I've, I've lived all over the place, but right now I currently um, have moved back to Birmingham, Alabama. So um, this has been a wild journey for sure. I can tell you that I, I just, I was trying to think about like what I was going to share. I tell my story and I'm grateful that I get to do that. Um, and I always try to like add new things into it, not like new, like just, Hey, let's make some stuff up. But I try to add new elements into it. So if anybody's ever seen me that they can hear something maybe a little different, but Um, ever since I was a kid, I always kind of had this different feeling of, um, insecurity, lack of confidence. Um, I was super sensitive. I would get my feelings hurt really easily. And, and I just, I just know that when I look back on it, I was an addict and alcoholic long before I ever took my first drink or drug. Like I can see addict alcoholic tendencies long before I ever did that. So, um, Sorry, my camera's in a little bit. My cat's kind of getting a little uh, squirrely. Um, but I just, uh, I started using it when I was 12 years old because I'd had a lot of things go on in my life. My parents, um, we lived in Arkansas at the time. My parents were getting ready to go through a nasty divorce, um, arguing, yelling, screaming, slamming doors. I had things from my childhood when I was five that kind of came up that I kind of remembered some things that had happened when I was five that it really kind of, it made me feel different because I knew even at five, like I knew that things had happened, but um 
but I knew that other kids didn't probably go through so, some of those things. And so I was always one of those. And I, I thought about this earlier today is that one of my biggest problems in life was that I always thought I was different and, and not different in like, I'm different from you and whatever, but like, I always thought I was the exception to the rule, uh, which is not that different for folks in recovery. I mean, I think a lot of us feel like we're the, we're the exceptions to the rule, but uh, I, I always would try any possible way to get around a rule. Um, and, but I would always try to be really smooth about it. You know, I was the baby of the family. Um, I would say, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Yes, sir. No, sir. Hold the door open for people, you know, do really, really great things. Teachers liked me, but then I would do, I would use that as a cover to be able to break the rules that I wanted to. And so if I ever did get caught, people would go that y'all, it must've been a big misunderstanding. Adam doesn't get in trouble like that. Um, he doesn't do stuff like that. And I would use that to my advantage being the baby of the family and stuff. So, uh, but at 12 years old, I, I, my best friend, he, uh, he, uh, smoked pot, his older brother sold. And, um, and so I called him up one day. I was like, Hey man, like, can you, can you get some pot for us? And he's like, dude, I've been smoking for like six months. I've been waiting for you to ask. And so we planned it all out. Then we got a, a thing. His dad was a, a doctor and his mom, and he and his dad, like when they weren't on call, like they would go tra travel and leave the kids at home because the, the brothers were older. And I remember we smoked that day. And I remember he told me, like, when I smoked, he goes, I'm just going to tell you right now. He's like, you're probably not going to feel it your first time. But I'm also one of those people, if you tell me that I can't do something, I'm going to do it. You know, I'm, I, and it's just that's part of that, that thing that drives me, like, still to this day. Like, if somebody tells me I can't do something, I'm going to do it just to prove them wrong. And, 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 and in some ways, it's been really helpful for me, but in a lot of ways, it was detrimental. But I remember I smoked that day, and we went back inside, and he goes, how do you feel? And I was like, I don't feel anything. And it seemed like 10 minutes went by, but it was probably like 10 seconds. But he's like, dude, how do you, feel? Do you, do you feel anything yet? I was like, man, I don't feel. And then all of a sudden, like, it's like, a, it's like this on the stage, the lights go down, you know? And it was just like, <clears throat> and it hit. And that feeling hit me. And he goes, I said, dude, what is this? And he goes, welcome to getting high. And, and I felt like I was walking on a cloud. I just, all... <sighs> The way that I look at it, and, and it talks about it in the big book, about it. it's like, you know, we have to get rid of this illusion and delusion, you know, like on page 30, because it talks about how like well, well, this illusion that we can drink and use like everybody else. And then it says the delusion has to be smashed. And the reality is, is that an illusion is something that I can see that's a lie outside of myself. So I always think of a magician, magician like makes, you know, uh, something disappear, right? So that's an illusion. Cutting the woman in half, the, this distance in half, that's an illusion. And then delusion is a lie inside. A, a delusion is a lie inside myself and that day like this illusion happened this magic happened and I was thinking back to it on the way home today like uh there's a quote from Bill Wilson and, and I, I really love learning about Bill because he was just such an interesting guy and he said the moment I took that first drink magic happened and to me it's like I, it doesn't matter to me what substance it was that anybody took right it's like I think people can typically relate to that statement because when I smoked that first bowl like all of a sudden magic happened man because my fears disappeared my insecurities disappeared my trauma disappeared my parents getting a divorce disappeared I didn't care about nothing all I cared about was like dude I want to do this again and and I did I went through 48 hours of pain and consequences because I thought my parents knew and I was paranoid and thought they knew stayed up all night waiting for them to catch me and I was not going to let them catch me um but it that's pretty much what happened you know and like two days later I realized they didn't catch me they didn't know and I, I made a decision, not maybe consciously, but in that moment, I said, you know what? I would rather have those 10 minutes of freedom and experience 48 hours of pain. And I'll, I'll, I'll gladly give that up because those 10 minutes of freedom were really great for me um, in that moment. And the truth is, is that if, if, if drugs and alcohol still worked the way that they did when I first started using, I'd still be using today. That's a fact, you know, and but something happened for me. You know, is that somewhere along that way, somewhere along that way from 12 years old when I started getting high um, until 23 when I got sober, like it stopped working. It stopped working as well. And then it stopped working for me and it started working on me. And and it was like this anchor. I didn't realize it at first. It felt like it was levitating me up and like lifting me up and making me light, making me like the, the world was a wonderful place. And in the end, man, it was I just I was so isolated and by myself that I, I had nowhere else to go. and so. Um, over the years, over those from 12 to probably like 16, 17, I would smoke pot and that was it. I think I tasted alcohol like once or twice. 
Um, I took ecstasy a, a little bit. It wasn't really my thing, but I was so worried about what everybody thought that I took it, you know, just would continue to keep taking it. And then when I was 18 years old, I went off to college. My parents decided in that time frame of like they were going to get a divorce that they decided literally the day of going to the, to the lawyer's house or the lawyer's um, office to sign the paperwork. They're like, you know what, let's just work it out. So we went through like six months of yelling, screaming, slamming doors, mutiny, people not talking to each other. And I don't blame anything on my parents and what they did. You know, they did the best they can. And as a parent today, I get that. Um, sometimes their best sucked. But, you know, but sometimes me as a parent, sometimes my best sucks, too. You know, and I get that. But what my parents did teach me how to do from the jump was um, they taught me how to wear a mask. Because, you know, those six days out of the week, like we would be, um, uh, you know, it would be like arguing, yelling, screaming, slamming doors, mutiny, whatever. And then on Sunday mornings, we'd all get up, we'd get dressed, and we'd hold hands and we'd walk into church and look like we were the cleavers, you know, and this all-American wholesome family. And, and so they taught me how to like put a mask on. And uh, so I just, I learned that and I used that for a long time. So when I was 18, the two days after I graduated high school, I was done. I was done with my family. I was like, I'm out, I'm out of here. See you guys later. My mom and dad were back together, but my mom had had an affair and the guy and like, you know, it just was a big, it was a big ordeal in the mess. Um, and so it was, uh, it was kind of hard to, to deal with that. And I just wanted to get away and kind of be on my own. So growing up in like the house I did, I grew up in this super religious household. And again, that's not a bad thing. You know? It just was the fact that, I, it was kind of, again, being in the South, it's like the hellfire and brimstone kind of deal. So I was taught like, you know, sex before marriage is horrible. Like if you, you know, even if you hold hands with a girl, like you're going to hell and it's all about protect the family image. But I would get all these contradicting messages, right? They would tell me to practice honesty and integrity and I would watch them not practice that. So when I got to college, dude, I, I let loose. Um, and I remember like the first time I was at my job at a softball complex, and my boss got us a keg and everything was good to go. Like, you know, they, they kind of had one at the end of the game or the end of the tournaments and stuff just to kind of celebrate. And, you know, everybody just kind of chill and relax. And they said, do you want to drink? I was like, no, nah, I'm good. I don't drink. And they said, are you sure? And that question showed up a lot in my life. You know, like I, they, somebody would ask me if I wanted to do something and I'd be like, no, I'm good. And they'd say, are you sure? And that sure made me think they're going to they're going to hate me. They're not going to like me. Like, I'm going to lose all these friends if I don't do it. And so I just did it. And I remember when I drank, man, all of a sudden, like my shoulders got wider and broader, you know, like I got taller, like I got smarter. I thought I was funnier. I had more confidence and stuff. And like that started my cycle for, for drinking. And, and within three months of drinking, I, I eh, maybe not three months of drinking, uh, four or five months into drinking, like I was already drinking like 12, 12 beers each time I was drinking. Um, staying out later than everybody else. Um, I got myself in a really bad bind at, um, on New Year's Eve of 2001, going in, or yeah, 2001 going to 2002. And I had enough. I was like, I'm done. I'm quit, quit, quit drinking. I'm done. This isn't, this is getting me in trouble. I'm good. And, uh, but I found out, I was like, like well, I like that feeling though, and I want that feeling. So I found out I could go down to like the, the doctor's office down in the, the university clinic and be like, hey man, I stuck my toe. And he would give me a prescription for lower taps. And this was back to, I mean, like I got my wisdom teeth taken out and they weren't hurting. I told them they were hurting, but they weren't, you know, they weren't bothering me one bit, but I went in there and got my wisdom teeth taken out because the dentist that I went to gave a, a, a prescription for lower tab. Um, like he gave the 30 and then he gave you a refill. And I feel uh, I took those in like six days. And so, I mean, it just was like nonstop, like this cycle of like whatever, like whatever I got my hands on, I was going to take. And it didn't matter if it was, dude, I was abusing Ambien. Um, I was abusing um, uh, Xanax. I was abusing opiate, any opiate I could get my hands on. But alcohol came back into my life and, and I started drinking pretty much um, as much as, as humanly possible as I could get my hands on. Um, and I would black out and, you know, go do things and say things that I had no recollection of what I was doing. And I really kind of, you know, like I said, just kind of made a, a fool out of myself. But um, somehow I graduated college in 2005. I graduated and I went to Columbus, Georgia and worked for my aunt and uncle. And, and they were great. They, they were very much trying to keep me and help me stay on track. All the people that, that I worked with because they were all older. They were trying to help keep me on track. And I just I couldn't I just couldn't do it. You know, I would I would go and, and be hungover as all get out on Saturday morning and be like, dude, I'm not drinking today. Like, no way. 
and I'd take a bunch of sleeping pills, go to sleep, you know, to get through the hangover. And then like 4.35 o'clock, I would wake up and I'd go, well, let me just go get like a six pack for the football game tonight, you know? And between the time I left my apartment to the store, I said, well, let me get a 12 pack because, you know, you can't buy on Sunday, like it's a certain time and I'll just, I'll save it for later in the week or something. And then by the time I'd park and go to the back of the store, I would be like, let me get a case, you know, I mean, just a case that way, like I don't have to come back out for the rest of the week. And, uh, and I would play drinking games with myself. I would see in a football game, like how many beers can I drink in a quarter, you know? Um, and, and let's see if I can break my record from last time. Cause all I wanted to do was just not feel, you know, and I would wake up Sunday mornings the same way, like with bottles all over the apartment, like, you know, and when I moved out of the apartment, my dad like got me moved out while I was in treatment because my lease was up anyway. And he said like the amount of drugs and alcohol that he found hidden in the apartment, he said it was ridiculous. Like I'd even like, like taken a, a Ziploc bag and sprayed it black and took a little string and, and, and sprayed it back, uh, black. And then um, I, I drilled a little hole in the garbage disposal, um, uh, little flaps, and then tied it to that and, and dropped it down into there. And then just hit the breaker where the, the garbage disposal so I could shut that off so I would never use it. But apparently I forgot all about that. Um, but that was my life, man. That, that's what my life looked like. I weighed 115 pounds when I went to treatment. I weigh about 170 right now. Um, I didn't go to treatment because I wanted to. I went to treatment because I pretty much ran out of plans. You know, I didn't have any other plans that I could do. I tried every possible thing. I tried changing uh jobs friends substances the way i did the substances like i tried to like put you know limits on myself accountability like normal people don't tell people hey cut me off after like if you see me do a certain amount cut me off like normal people never say that normal people never have to go to a restaurant and say like okay guys i'm only gonna have two jaeger bombs tonight all right you know it's like normal people don't say that um normal people don't think nothing cocaine's a good idea either but apparently i found out but um but I went to treatment and I went there and I, again, I was there on December 22nd and, you know, I was shaking, my hands were shaking because like at that point, like when I start, you know, when I don't drink after a while, like, you know, I get, I get the shakes, I start having withdrawals, you know, and I start going through the, you know, the opiate withdrawals as well, you know, cause I was taking opiates kind of sporadically there, but enough to where I start to feel it if I didn't take anything. Um, but I remember that last night when I went out, I, I went out and, and made a full out of myself. I drove home drunk. I drove, drove home in a blackout. I don't remember. I thought to myself like one more time, like, oh my God, what if I hit somebody? And, and I was terrified. I was, that was enough. I was like, I got to do something. So I ended up in the ER that night and then in treatment the next morning. And initially going to treatment, I was like, this is a great idea. I'm really excited about this. I don't have to live like this anymore. And then like literally a second later, I was like, this is the worst decision I've ever made in my entire life. Like, this is horrible, dude. Let's turn around. And my dad's like, listen to me, turn around. You're going to wake up. Um, when you, if you leave, when you get there, that's fine with me. I don't care, but I'm dropping you off, at least putting you on the property. Um, and it was while I was there, I was really grateful that there was guys that had been in treatment before that were older than me. And, and they were like, I would hear their stories. And I'd be like, man, I didn't do that. You know, I didn't do, I didn't lose a marriage. I didn't lose any kids. I haven't blown a career. And they just said, man, you don't have to. Because I thought you had to be like certain things to be an alcoholic or an addict, right? I thought you had to be like, you know, 40 something years old, living under a bridge, drinking out of a brown paper bag. And like, there are people who do that. But I didn't think I could be an alcoholic with a bachelor's degree at 23 years old, you know? But yet I have an apartment that doesn't have power at times, right? I have a car that like ends up being my my home and where I sleep because I run out of gas because drugs and alcohol are more important than gas. And somebody's always going to be really nice. Um Somebody's always going to be really nice and give you gas anyway. But um, I got into the rooms and I started listening to what people were saying. And part of me was like, maybe this could work. Maybe this can't. And I committed to my sponsor at the time that I was going to get. Um, I would do this work for six months. And if I didn't like the results, that I, I wasn't going to do it anymore. And during that time, I was living with the best friend and his parents. And they kicked me out after about, about six weeks. And it wasn't because I got high. I wasn't because of where he laughs. I was going to my meetings, calling my sponsor, doing my step work, but I didn't follow the rules. Like, again, every, even the littlest, simplest rule they would give me, like I would try to find my way around it, you know? And I was thinking about it. It's like, it's like normal people go to the store and they buy a box of Sara Lee cake mix. You know what I mean? And like, they, they look at the back of the box and they do what it says, you know, two eggs, uh, you know, a uh, half a cup of flour, you know, mix it together, 350 on the oven for an hour. And when I get the box of Sara Lee, I like look at the back and I go, well, I don't have two eggs. I got one and I don't really want 
like a half a thing of flour. I kind of want a full thing of flour because I want my, my cake to really rise. And then I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to throw my cake in the, in the oven uh, at 450 so I can have it in 40 minutes instead of 60 minutes. And then my cake comes out and it looks horrible and it tastes horrible. It looks like sloth from the Goonies or chunk for the sloth or yeah, it was sloth from the Goonies. Um, and, and I'm like sitting there going like, dude, Sarah Lee doesn't know how to make a dead gum cake. Like what's wrong with Sarah Lee? Like, how did she get a deal? You know what I mean? Because, because the thing was like, I never followed the instructions. I never followed directions. You no. Know? And people were trying to help me so long ago. Like when I could think about it. Like so many suggestions I would get, people would try to help me. And I just never would listen because I didn't think it applied to me. And finally, man, I was like, I started, I was like, you know what? All right, I'm going to start taking these suggestions and start listening to people and see what happens. You know, and again, if I don't like it, I'll, I'll go out and do whatever I got to do. And all of a sudden, like slowly but surely, life started getting better. Like my relationship started getting better with people. Like this thing, this concept of this spirituality for me was so important because, again, religion had kind of left a bad taste in my mouth from when I was a kid. So when they came, when I came in and they were like, Hey man, like you can choose any higher power that you want, go for it. And I was like, I don't even think you can do that. And my sponsor was like, who, who said that your mom? And I was like, I don't know, maybe he goes, well, he's like, you can come up with whatever conception you want. He's like, if you look at a cloud outside on a, on a day that has big puffy clouds that look like shapes and stuff. And I ask you what it looks like. And you say, it looks like a boat. And then I, I pull Willie aside. I say, hey, Willie, what does that look like? The same cloud. He never heard your answer. And he said, oh, it looks like a dragon. What's the difference? It's, it's a cloud at the end of the day. The only difference was it's like your perception of what you saw. He's like, so what your perception of your higher power is, I mean, that's your business. He's like, he goes, you don't have to explain it because you don't have to defend it. It's just yours. And, and I say this a lot in recovery is that like at almost 15 years sober, like I have less of an understanding of my higher power than the day I got here. And I think to me, that's a, that's a beautiful thing because what that tells me is, is that I, I've finally gotten to the place where I stop trying to understand my higher power and I just allow myself to experience my higher power. Because I will, it doesn't matter how long I've been sober, how many books I read, how many meetings I go to, how many, you know, uh, you know, uh, holy water, seven Hail Marys, like I'm never going to understand my higher power, never. But if I get out of my way, I can experience it, you know, and I get to experience it in things like, you know, being with people that I love, you know, going and seeing like, you know, my son play soccer, going and watching the sunset, watching, going down to the beach and having a great time and just enjoying the experience. Um, and during that time frame, like I was able to, uh, I started like working the steps and I started making amends to people, you know, and, and most of the amends that I made during that time period like went really, really well, you know, I would say three out of four would go really, really well, you know, and one would be really rocky, but it would sometimes kind of come back. And it's just because people wanted to see me actually follow through with action. Cause I said a lot of really great things when I was drinking and using, but like I sucked at follow through. And so a lot of people really wanted to see what I was doing. And thank goodness, like I worked the steps in order, you know, because by the time I got to the ninth step to make the amends, a lot of people had seen that I was living differently. Um, and I remember doing my fourth step and just being terrified of like writing some of these things down. But what I found out was that that really um, um, insecure and sensitive kid was still there. You know, at 24, when I started doing because I just got sober at the end of 23 going into 24. I was I was a 24 year old kid who had no idea how to regulate emotions, who had no idea how to deal with feelings, who had no idea how to deal with success or failure or rejection or whatever, because you would say something, but what I would hear you say was completely different than what you said, you know? Because in my mind, it was like, that's where my mind got. It got so warped because of that, you know? And uh, I just started getting into this work, man. And like, I started, I was like, how is these 12 steps even gonna help me? And, and, I'll, and it did, 100%, it absolutely did. Um, because I begin to have this connection with my higher power, begin to have this connection with, um, with, um, with myself. I begin to have connections with other people. And that's where like in that process, like I finally allowed myself to be vulnerable and meet somebody, you know, and I met my wife in the rooms, you know, and, um, it was such a cool experience for me to be able to do that. Um, for me to be able to, to meet, um, this person who was on this journey with me. And we, we had this opportunity where like, you know, we, we've been together now 14 and a half years. Um, and she's got, she just picked up 14 years back in May, which is awesome. 
So she's like six months behind me, but we've got to do this journey together, you know, and I can be completely honest with her. I don't hold secrets with her. You know, I can, I can honestly say today, 100%, like with her, like I'm completely transparent, you know, even if it's something I don't want to talk to her about, I'm terrified to talk to her about. I still can do that because like, she's, she's my partner. You know, and what I found in that, and the reason why I bring that up is because when I did my fourth step, especially on like my resentments and my sex inventory, like I found out like at five years old, um, I developed this idea because of this girl in class, in my class pulled my pants down. And I developed this idea in the back of my head subconsciously, I guess, that all women try to embarrass me. And it was through step work that I figured out that they, that idea existed in my head. And no wonder, like, I was horrible in relationships for the next 18 years of my life, because I always thought the person I was in a relationship was going to hurt me and harm me. And so I better do it first. And once I saw that idea through the step work and through my fourth and fifth step, you know, I was able to, like, let that go. I didn't ask my higher power, please remove this defective character of selfishness or dishonesty. Like, I asked my higher power, please help me remove this idea. And this amazing thing happened because I began to change as a human being. And I got to sponsor men and I've been able to sponsor men. And some of the guys that uh, one of my, my sponsees that um, he's got 12 years now and he just got uh, this week, he sent it to me. Um, he got a pardon, like a full pardon and his record is expunged. Um, and he had, I couldn't tell you how many felonies, but it was a lot. Um, but he was like, man, he goes, this is the evidence of like doing this work, you know, and he, he's got a wonderful career today. Um, and I've had sponsees that made it and I had sponsees that didn't make it, you know, and one of my, my favorite people, man, was a kid named Joey St. John. And I, I try to talk about him anytime I speak, because I promised his mother that I would never let somebody like his, his story be forgotten, you know, and that he would be forgotten. Um, but he was kind of, I mean, he was a younger kid, 20, 21 years old, you know, and he, he said, man, if you, if you ever see me slipping, you know, it's like, tell me. And so I he was, he was kind of slipping up and I texted him. I said, Hey man, you're screwing up, dude. Like, let's get back on track. And he got mad. And he said, the last thing he said was F you, you know? And I was like, whatever, dude, I can care less. Like, get, get over yourself. And, um, we didn't talk the next day. And that Monday it was kind of bothering me. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to do this deal. You know, I'm going to call him up or whatever. And I got the call that he had passed. He had overdosed. He had gone back out. And overdosed, you know, and it was the most devastating thing because I didn't realize the damage that was probably the first time I'd realized the damage that like that my use could cause with other people, you know, because I saw, and I still talk to his mother to this day and like, she still, you know, grieves, but, but she's been able to help so many other parents, you know, that have gone through that or struggling with it. And, and I have this wonderful life today, you know, like I get to like be a part of other people's lives, even if a small part, I get to be a part of people's lives. And, I get to work with other men and I get to work now at the treatment center that I, that I went to, which is such a blessing. And I've been there now for 12 years, um, coming up on 13 years. And, you know, um, five years ago, um, one of the coolest things happened was my son was born and, 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 and Willie and I were talking about this before we got started was that, yeah, like my son is kind of all over my Instagram account because I mean, like to me, like that's one of the coolest things I've ever done in my entire life was to be a father, you know? And, and I'm grateful today that like my son has never seen me drink. He's never seen me take a drug. He's never seen me under the influence of anything. And I know that's not everybody's story and that's okay because at the end of the day, like, you know, your story can help even, even if you did, you know, your story may help your kids not ever go down that path. And, um, uh, you know, I just, one of the last things I guess I would end with is that, you know, I, I have to take care of myself on a regular basis. Like I have to do this deal. Like even all these years later, I still work this program, but one of the other things I have to do the outside help that it talks about in the big book, because, you know, suicides littered all throughout my family and, and my father committed suicide father's day of 2015. Um, and, and he and I were on, on splits in that moment. Um, and, and, and so I, I, you know, suicide was a thought for me, like even in sobriety, you know, so if that happens to you understand that, that sometimes that does happen, you know, but the main thing is to reach out. You know, I, I'm a therapist and I went and talked to a therapist. I needed that. I needed to have somebody to, to vocalize this stuff because sometimes my step work is great, but sometimes I need a little bit more. And for me, one of the main things that I've learned in recovery that's so important for me is that it's hard to fall off the edge if you're standing in the middle. And for me, like I have to stay in the middle of this program, you know, and continue to, to, to be the guy that I need to be and to continue to work on being the best man that I can be. And some days I do really great. Some days I fall short. But every day that I wake up, I wake up sober. And every day that I wake up, it gives me an opportunity to do something different. So thank you so much. Uh, I greatly appreciate the time and the opportunity. Man, I really like that. Every day that you wake up is a day to do something different. Yeah. 
Yeah, his his story is amazing. What'd you guys think, Marty? What'd you think of that? You know Adam. Yeah. yeah, you know I do know Adam. I know Adam well. We 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 talk quite often, and uh, you know, do something different. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's a fact. Yeah. You know, because doing the same old thing get us the same old results. Yeah, right. So we got to do something different. Yeah. yeah, I appreciate that because we're talking here, you know, a lot about uh, about uh, our daily maintenance and, you know, sort of a routine we talked a lot about. But but every day, you know, that we wake up is a new opportunity to change somebody's life in a different way. Yeah. Um, and, and that's a surefire way to get out of ourself. I really, uh, what part about his story did you sort of identify with the most, Willie? Uh, you're probably not going to feel it the first time. Right. <laughs> Does everybody have that experience with like with word this? for word? Yeah. I was told that, you know, and I, and, and, uh, it was true, but I also remember the first time I felt it. Yeah. And I agree with him, you know, at that point in my life, I would rather have 10 minutes of that freedom. Mm -hmm. And, and I chased that 10 minutes of freedom for way too fucking long. Oh yeah. You know? And so going in and, and I could, I could, and, and the other thing that I could really relate with, I remember when my parents were having trouble mm -hmm. and I remember going to family counseling and I remember watching the bullshit shit show that the adults around me, I've shared about it a thousand times on this show that, you know, the, the, the people that I believed were in charge of my life we're doing the best they could, but sometimes their best wasn't that great. Sure. Just like he said. And, and it put me in a place where the first thing I put on in the morning was a mask. Yeah. And I did that for a very, very long time, you know, going to counseling and seeing, being told one thing and watching another. Mm -hmm. Right. Boom, 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 boom. And, and finding, finding the relief that I needed in the streets and in dope. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I really, I really liked uh, his sort of journey with religion and a higher power, you know, and he, he gets to this point where he talks about how he doesn't care. He doesn't need to define it. Yeah. Right? Like he gets to experience it instead of define it. Yeah. And I think Jackson, you had said when we were talking before the show, that that's kind of where you're at. And then I think Willie, you had said, that's kind of where I'm at. And it's like, it's amazing that, you know, we, we hear these stories and we pick out all these different things that we're able to identify with. And what I liked about him sharing his story is he's encouraging others to share their story yeah. for the same reason. Like, this is why we do this, right? I can find something in his story that I can identify with and I can apply to my own world and my own life. And, and, uh, and for any newcomers that are out there, like, Hopefully you'll find something that you can hear yeah. and identify with. And, and what that means luckily is that what worked for him might work for me. Right. You know? And that's why I, I like to hear these different stories. Jackson, what did you think uh, when he talked about that experience, your higher power, did you, I mean, can you tell us a little bit about your experience with that? Well, it's interesting because <clears throat> when I started noticing my reaction to life, my reaction to things that used to like really get me frustrated or discouraged, you know, after working a program of recovery, doing, going through steps, I started to actually notice, you know, that, that my reaction and I come to learn and find out that that's actually considered a, a spiritual experience. Mm -hmm. When my reaction to life is, is is a little bit different, you know, when that horn blows and that dude behind me, <laughs> I'm not freaking hitting the brakes and jumping out right. of the car to go yeah. check him. You know, I'll feel myself. That rage will come, but then I go, you, you know, do and something I, different. Yeah, and I totally can do something different. And literally, I, that's what I consider this this spiritual experience. Because again, all through life, I'll never be able to comprehend this God thing, but I experience something bigger than myself every day of my recovery every single day and why because i've opened myself to a program i've been able to kind of set aside all the prejudice that i had about god yeah. again yeah. god and prejudice again th that dude is like out there get me there's no way you know this all condemning friggin' god and i can't do what you want god yeah. you know what the heck I'm, I'm i'm a dope fiend bro what do you what do you what do you expect for me to do and every time i tried I'd go right back. But again, was I really trying? You know, yeah. I didn't really employ a program of recovery. Now that I'm employing it, I can clearly experience 
my ability to recognize me, my ability to recognize those 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 rage moments, those moments where I'm feeling a little bit depressed. Mm -hmm. Depression is another big thing for me as well. And I can automatically turn to somebody else. Again, that's an experience. That's something different that I never employed. It's weird. It's a little bit unfamiliar initially, but sometimes I'll just text a dude and just say, yo, like literally that's different for me. I I don't have nothing to say because I'm, yo, I'll text somebody just yo. I'll go down the list just saying yo to like, 10, 11 Reaching different out. people. Yeah. And again, sometimes they'll respond, hey, Jackson, what's up? And all of a sudden, boom, something changes inside of me. I don't know. Like I said, the experience counted more to me than trying to figure out, mm-hmm. trying to figure out this God. Is it a him or is it a her? Is it a, it, what, what is this? Is, is it Jesus Christ? Is it Buddha? Is it a, I don't, I don't, again, I know my personal Lord and Savior is Jesus. That's me personally. But again, for any, each and every person, recovery is about finding your own path, and you're going to experience it. And that's just what I did. And you, you, I can guarantee you will experience too if you have the open mind to say, "Hey, look, there's something, you know, other than me going on because I'm reacting a little bit different. I'm reacting a little bit different. Mm-hmm. You're least willing, right? Did you hear that, Willie? Yeah. You don't. You don't have to define it. Yeah, that's what I'm working on, man. You know, I'm just working on, working well, on, working on. Yeah, it. and we're so conditioned to try to define it. Right. Be- because, again, it needs to make sense to me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I learned just recently that the God, of my understanding, lays outside of the construct. And that was a new concept to me. It's outside of this construct of of a being. Mm-hmm. It's it's not a being. It's not a, you know, the, his time is on a whole different plane. You know what I mean? That was like a whole new you know, epiphany for me to realize, oh, yeah. hey, this God is, he's not in the construct of the human realm. He's in that fourth dimension. I don't know diddly about the fourth dimension. <laughs> right. So why am I trying to figure yeah. it all out? You know what right. I mean? I just know I feel something feels different inside. Mm-hmm. When I freaking, when I, like I said, the biggest thing I use, guys, is that horn blows. That was one of my biggest, biggest triggers, bro. You blow the horn at me, that's an invitation. You need to know who I am now. I'm yeah. going to get out the car. I'm going to chase you down. And even in sobriety, that happens, you know? Sure. I chased a dude down a couple of months ago, and he threw a bunch of pennies out there, and I freaking was gun. And then I caught myself. I'm like, what the hell am I <laughs> yeah, doing? What I can am play I doing? it. I can play it out saying, dude, okay, I get this guy. We pull over. Boom, he's got a strap. You know, I got a strap. Now I'm, you know you, what I mean? You die an alcoholic's death. And, and all of that, it just, it just could go. I could totally Sober. see it. Yeah. And, and again, so again, I learned that my reaction to life, I don't have to comprehend you know, this construct within the human realm. Mm-hmm. I, I go, you know, it's outside of that construct, but I experience it and I feel something internally. Mm-hmm. That's on page 567, by the way. <laughs> I've, well, at least you know the big mm-hmm. one. Well, last paragraph. Yeah. <laughs> I'm page 567 of yeah. the oh, big book. Yes, sir. Yes. Synonymous. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I, I, uh, I, I love the individual journeys that we all get to have with, uh, with the power greater than yeah. ourselves. And I think there's definitely evidence mm-hmm. that, uh, that there's been that psychological change in me. And along, along with, uh, with Adam, you know, like mm-hmm. he had that psychological change. I really appreciate that he talked about suicide in his story. Yeah, totally. Yeah, because totally. I think that that's a lot of times the reality of the disease. And, and, and Marty, I know that we were talking earlier and you were talking about how, um, you know, prior to it's it's a place you can get into if you're not working a program and you yeah. start you start buying what your mind is telling you. And that's been a part of your journey as well. Is it, is it not? Absolutely. You know, um, suicide is is the reality of insanity. Right. Mm. I mean, when we have no other way out. Hmm. No other way, we you know. Try, we yeah. we've tried, we've tried drugs. We've tried alcohol. Hmm. We've tried church. We've tried counseling. We've tried hmm. everything. So in our minds, or in my mind, suicide's the only way out, hmm. you know. And uh, and coming to this program, and I think everybody knows that when I got here, there was no God, hmm. and when. You people in the 12 step program started talking about God. I shut up, I didn't want nothing to do with it, and so I, yeah, exactly. Like, I didn't want to hear that, yeah. you know. I'll work everything you ask me to work other than anything that has to do with a higher power, sure. And uh, you know, I had a 
a spiritual awakening that was pretty profound. And from that day forward, you know, I know that there's a power greater than myself that's guiding me in my journey. Mm -hmm. I know that, you know, I'm, I'm not going to define it as man, woman, mm -hmm. beast, whatever. I'm not going to define that because my higher power is different than yours. Yeah. You know, in, in some fashion, my higher power is different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's okay because that's what works for me. Right. You know, I had a, a cousin of mine a couple months ago who it got too much for him. Mm. And and he left behind a wife and a child. And I was sitting in the funeral home and I was thinking, what could ever mm. be so terrible? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it brought me back to right before I walked through the doors. Mm. It brought me back, you know, I know what was so terrible. Yeah. I could not escape this addiction. And... So, yeah. Yeah, self, what did I say? Self-reliance had failed me utterly. utterly. Yeah, utterly. 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 Right? Completely. Absolutely. So, again, so it only makes sense. Suicide, man, just do it. Like I said, when I was getting booked into custody at last rest, they said, are you homicidal or suicidal? And I just, God bless her, but I just finished trying to, you know, strangle my, my, my daughter's mother. Suicide, I mean, homicidally, you know, and then I was suicidal because I remember texting, I'm going to kill myself, I'm going to kill mm -hmm. myself. So there I was, they're asking me, are you homicidal or suicidal? And I just, I broke, bro. I just, I, I everything was just, I, di I didn't know where to go. And that state of hopelessness, like I said, would lead me six years later sitting right here mm -hmm. to be able to talk about it and yep. tell about it. If you're suicidal, homicidal, if you're in that state of mind, we want to be here to let you know, let's talk about it, bro. Yeah. Let's talk about it, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, there is a solution for sure. Yeah. And Adam, Adam's a great a great example of that solution. You Absolutely. know, and, and he wanted me to mention too that right now he's he's um, heading up uh, leading team twelve online Zoom meetings. You can find them on Instagram at team twelve. Just look up team twelve. Team X I I or X I I and yeah. and there's a link to those meetings there. Um, and so, you know, if you want to connect with him that way or, or come check out one of those meetings, it's open right now every Friday at, uh, eight o'clock Pacific standard time. Mm -hmm. now, they're good meetings. We've yeah. been to a couple there. Marty's been to a couple. It's mm -hmm. like an all-star meeting sometimes. Yeah. It's, it's pretty great. But, uh, so, yeah, yeah, I just want to really thank Thanks. Adam mm -hmm, for, for, uh, for your story. And I think that a lot of people will get a lot of great stuff from it. Yeah, it's so. really good. Thanks. This has been fun. Yeah. This has been a really yeah. fun shoot Topic, day. man. Yeah. Yeah, it's been cool, you know, and, and you know, Adam, uh, me and Adam are pretty tight. We we talk on a regular basis, and uh, and it might be something like Jackson was talking about where it's just yo or whatever, but mm -hmm. I'll be driving down the highway, and I'll crank the music as loud as I can, and I'll take a video, and I'll send it to Adam, and he'll be sitting in his <laughs> desk with his tie on, and he'll start singing an ACDC song or something, <laughs> you know, right, and, and, and that and, counts, bro, that counts. Yeah. <laughs> and that leads back to that fun of yeah, recovery, yeah. man. Yeah. You know, Adam's a good dude, man. I'm honored to be his friend. Yeah. Well, and it, and it speaks to that connection too. Like it's been amazing to me to see how how we have expanded our our circle like so much in the last year and a half. Like we got Jackson here from Los Angeles. We got Marty here from color or Wyoming. Yeah. I always want to say Colorado. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> And honestly, like we owe that to Instagram. Absolutely. Yeah. Which is weird, you know, like, yeah. but it, and, and for us, like it really took COVID for us to really kind of yeah. expand like that. And so yeah. I don't know, like, I, I think that it's been an amazing journey in, in my recovery to have people like you guys come in, talk to us about your story, to, to talk to us about you know what it is you guys are doing on an individual basis to stay sober and uh and to yeah. stay emotionally strong you know yeah i just wanted to add in real quick too because you you mentioned that this really took took flight from you know the pandemic going down and i remember specifically thinking to myself you know this was this could have went either way mm -hmm. like like literally i remember thinking this could have went either way but you know what i'm isolated at home stay at home that's where I got down, bro. That yep. was, I don't have to deal with nobody, bro. That was a space where I could have actually just, it could have went a whole nother direction, 
You see what I mean? Oh, yeah. And, and had justifiable reasons to stay disconnected. Yep. Because this disease literally wants us to be disconnected. I got written in my big book, this disease wants me to be alone. Mm. Yep. The opposite of addiction is connection. connection. Yeah. See how we do that in unison? Again, already. <laughs> the opposite of addiction is <laughs> connection. connection. Uh, again, and again, what better, funner, cool, funner? Is that word? Yeah, funner. funner. Yeah, what funner funner, funner cooler fun. way than to you know, come up with this platform right here to really be able to share our stories. This is gratitude in action, guys. Yes. Oh, yeah, to yeah. tell the story. It ain't, oh, listen to my story. Look at what I'm doing. Look at my life. No, this is to say, hey, look. Look at what I will go back to if I don't continue yep. my maintenance. Look, this is what I will go back to, and I'm clear about that. Like I said, this could have went any direction for alcoholics and drug addicts like us, but we chose recovery. We didn't choose to not pick up. We chose to dig into this recovery platform to create a, a place, a safe, solid place where we can share our stories of hope, and encouragement to everybody out there, man. Again, that's why I applaud you guys, man. Ah, oh, thanks, man. Perfect. For you. <clears throat> yeah, thank you so much, Jackson. And again, can't add much to that. Yeah, thanks for coming all the way out here, and um, thanks, Jordan, thanks everybody for watching. Jordan, thank you. I don't think we thanked you on the last episode. Just know that we appreciate yeah. you, man. Rylan, Rylan, thank you, man, for Aaron coming out. Jordan. You guys are doing an amazing job. Yeah. Kind of, uh, kind of complicated when there's this many people on this side of the table, but we're doing it pretty well today. Yeah. So. Thanks, you guys. Uh, if you want to see Marty's story, he was on episode blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah. His story, I'm not sure what episode. I'll put a link in the you, show notes. You can go back and don't forget to check out Stay Stopped. You know. Uh, and you guys, yeah, let's do it, man. Let's wrap it out with that. <laughs> let's get the hell out of here, guys. Okay. I'm out Remember, here. guys, you are worth the work. We'll see you on the other side. The other side of hell. <laughs> Stay Stopped. The Other Side of Hell is a do-it-yourself podcast. For more information, recovery resources, and contact info, check out our website at theothersideofhellpodcast.com. You can help us spread our message by liking and subscribing, giving us a follow, or a five-star rating.